It's a beautiful song, not only the melody, but the words are very profound. I don't know if you could grasp some of the words, but this, this is something that uh, we have to always do that uh, to ourselves and remember that we have to diminish so that Christ can grow in us. Uh, and this is a, as a challenge for us sometimes to, sometimes we have been so many years in the Christianity that sometimes we forgot that we need to diminish. We just sometimes live in the pilot mode. We kept going, kept going, but we need to remember that the only source to our lives is Jesus Christ. And He's the one that imposes us, He's the one that convinces us, He's the one who gives us strength. Uh, there's a song that said, he's, uh, he's is my strength when my strength is gone. So when your strength is gone, you remember that Jesus is your strength. Yeah? I can do all things to Christ who will give me strength, right? He's strengthening me. Yes. Uh, it's a beautiful song. And uh, our former president of the IMB, several years ago, I was actually through in, going through uh, my, our training. And he said something that is stuck into my mind. He said... Uh, the calling that you have today to all of you is going to take you to the mission field. I have no doubt about that. But what's going to keep you there is going to be your life with Christ. Because a lot of temptations, a lot of, many times, we want to give up. And uh, in last year, and four years ago we came, so this is, especially coming to Florida, let me tell you, it's a different, it's a different story. No? If you come to other cities, but we love Florida. We love here, and this beautiful weather, and everything is nice, nice roads, big and large roads. We don't have that in Europe. I mean, those that have been living know this tight. Probably Germany is the best place. Uh, Germany is a different part of Europe. Uh, and Switzerland, you know, all that, those countries. But if you go to Italy, Spain, and, and Portugal, there's some roads that need to go, that you need to actually to close your, uh, your, your, your mirrors. So you can go through it because it's so tiny. I think I think when they go to the parking lots and the malls there, they got this car called Smart. I think they put the Smart over there. Okay, it fits. So all of them is gonna be the same. So there's no space for trucks, big cars. So only for small cars. Um, so I'm very glad to be here and I'm glad to to see you all again. Uh, we had a wonderful meal this afternoon with uh, some of the ladies here, and we had a, a wonderful time and that uh, we enjoy so much and thank you so much for taking care of us and for caring us uh i just want to review quick before i just can jump into the whatever uh the lord is telling me today uh there's a passage in psalms chapter 92 and i'm going to be reading out of the niv version okay the new international version psalms 92 uh 12 to 15. Okay, verse 12 to 15. You with me already? Yeah. Okay. I see some pages still passing, so I can't wait if you want. Okay? But it says, the, the passage in my version says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God, they will still bear fruit in old age. This is for you guys. And for me too. You still can bear fruit in old age. They will still they will stay fresh and green. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no weakness in him. Amen. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was 1985, Coca-Cola decided to to take out of the production the the main coca-cola so they started coming with a new coca-cola new types of coca-cola but there were so many complaints about it because people wanted to coca-cola to come back with the original recipe basically with the old recipe so they decided to come back with coca-cola again and put coca-cola classic so all the coca-cola classic that you drink is the old type of coca-cola is the best seller of coca-cola that means that old is good right <laughs> right it means that old is authentic right it means that old is genuine 
So you got to think about that. You guys are genuine, authentic. And, uh, and the Bible says in Acts that the elders are given responsibility to teach the young. Now the, the ladies, to teach the young ladies how to love their husband, how to serve and all that. So love can be taught, you know. I think we can teach people to love too. So it's it just I want to say to you that there's a lot of examples in the Bible about many people that they actually did a lot of great things in early and um, in late ages, like Moses and Aaron. You know, they, they they were chosen to be leaders of Israelites. I mean, they are very on the 80, 88 years old, so they still had to lead the people of God out of the, uh, Egypt. Joshua and Caleb, you know, they start young, but they continue. Until he was 110 years old, he's still working for the Lord. Daniel, uh, he was actually served for God from the days of his youth for over more than 70 years. He actually was working with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, how you say that? That's how you say it? Uh, king of Judah. Yeah. Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. He was with Darius, the Mede. And also he was in the early years of Cyrus, Cyrus the Persian. So he worked for many years for the Lord. So we have a lot of examples. Zechariah and Elizabeth, you know, they were in the temple when Jesus was there. And the only thing he asked, I wanna, before I go to heaven, I want to see the Son of Man. I want to see Jesus before I can go. So you guys already have done that. So I just want to say to you that it's important to, that sometimes God is not calling you maybe to go to foreign missions. But missions doesn't have to be just foreign. It doesn't have to be just internationally. You can do missions right where you are. I mean, uh, I always say, um, I heard a friend of mine say, I kept that in my heart, said, uh, if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, you are a missionary. And if someone does not have Jesus Christ in their hearts, they are a mission field. So we have to think about that. Uh, many churches put a sign over there and say, you enter in the mission field. Sometimes we go to churches. Yeah, mission fields out there. So you can do still do missions. So... Talking about missions, you know, we, uh, I, I waited a long time. For me, I, I, was, I waited a long time to fulfill my dream. Uh, uh, in 1984, 1988, March 14, I decided I want to be, do this the rest of my life. I don't want to see doing another thing. I don't want to go back to church today. This is my thinking. And to pastor a church. Today, I want to be in the mission field and see people coming to Christ. See all nations, you know, because this is actually the desire of God, that all nations bow down, all nations should bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And, uh, and this is our heart. And I can see this church has the same heart. It's wonderful to see that in your website you have the mission uh, word say about how you care and how you are passionate about the mission field. Maybe you cannot go anymore, but you still can do a lot of things. The commission is done with three things. Those that can go, those that can pray, and those that can contribute. And so probably you cannot do all three, but I bet, I bet you can do two, at least two of those, right? So I'm very, I'm very glad uh, to, to be representing you, representing the Southern Baptist uh, and in the mission field. Um, there's a lot of struggles. I have seen a lot of colleagues that have really suffered many things. There's some many, many, many stories that we can tell about colleagues that are really suffering in the mission field. And the devil is, is doing his part. He's working 24 hours to destroy and the work that we're trying to do. He's doing, trying to do everything. I was just listening on the car on the way here, how the devil desires really to destroy our families. And uh, I was telling uh, Gwen and, and, and Charlotte this, 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 this afternoon, and uh, there's a law they're trying to pass in South America that they want to destroy the family. They want to remove the name father and mother from the books of the children in schools. They want to just call, call caregiver. Uh, because they said a lot of parents, single parents, can be embarrassed because they don't have a father or mother. So they're trying to destroy. Actually, they have actually a kit they're trying to distribute to the kids. They wanted to distribute in one state that they're already doing. They want to do it. This, uh, this, what they're saying that the, it's okay for a boy, a little boy, to touch the other boy parts. It's okay for the little girl to touch the other girl parts. They're discovering this is a natural thing. But there's so many things going on. 
And not only there, in our country too, here in the United States is the same thing. They're trying to, to, to kill the family. And once they, they, they destroy the family, they're going to destroy our society. And, uh, and they're going to destroy our churches because strong churches is based on strong families. So we need to think about that. But uh, being a mission field, um, like I said, I grew up in a, in a Christian family. She grew up in a Christian family. And when I met my wife, uh, she didn't have the call at all. Uh, and I told her that I have a call. I was I knew where where I want to go. And she said, oh, I don't want to date this guy. I don't want to be a mission field. <laughs> no at all. No, no, no. I want to I want to marry to a local pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to meet. I want to I want to I want to marry to a local pastor. But I said to you, I said I told her, and she knows that. The moment I saw her, and I put a finger in her face, said. You're gonna marry me. Oh. <laughs> you, then what day you saying this to me? I say you are the one I was praying for. I was I started praying for my wife when I was 13 years old, in a camp. I went to a camp, and my father was preaching this camp, and we went to a, uh, to do some fire on this camp, and uh, suddenly a guy came in, in the middle of nowhere, uh, in a Spanish country. He started just cursing in English. You know, perfect English, but he was cursing perfectly in English. And he said, "Stop talking! What are you talking? Because I'm going to kill all of you over here. I don't want to hear none of this sense here. I don't want to hear nothing of this over here." And we were talking that day about praying for our life, praying for our future. And I remember exactly that moment. You know, when I was I was 13 years old. That day I started praying for that. I, I think it was the shortest message I ever heard in my life. My father was preaching that night and this guy just brings a, a backpack and take a knife like this big a knife and put it in my father's back and say if you don't shut up right now I'm gonna stab you right here and I said to all of you he's, you're not gonna go alone you're gonna come with him so he takes a grenade from his backpack and he just kind of trying to pull the pin of the grenade and say you gotta stop right now because this Jesus is nothing. He's worth nothing. The, who's who's going to reign here is the Queen of La Merced, which is the Mary of that city. So my father just closed his eyes and started praying. And we just started praying, crying, and saying, what, why we need to go this? Why I have to do all these things? But the story is, after my father stopped, uh, he stopped praying, he looked around, the guy was not there anymore. He disappeared. I think an angel took him. Amen. He took him away. So, at that moment, I think my father did an invitation. I think the guy helped his illustration to really, to really shake our hearts, you know, little kids' hearts. Oh, and then, oh no, we need to pray. We need to pray. So she's the answer of my prayers. So I met and I told her, I'm gonna marry. She said, I'm crazy. You're stupid. You know all those kind of things. But right? here it is. I so, but I told her that I'm, I have the mission call. She said, I never have the mission call. But I never pushed it. I never said, I was just praying. She was praying for me to uh, change my mind, and I was praying her to, to change her mind. <laughs> and then say, let's see who's going to win. Because <laughs> I, I was convicted that the Lord called me to a specific uh, call to be a mission, the mission field outside in, in, uh, in the foreign world. And I prayed, I prayed. One time she went to the mission conference here after several years being married. We have been married for 19 years. Amen. So it's, uh, today's a, celebra it's a celebration, right? In this age that we live, it's a celebration to be married 19 years. Uh, so yeah, we are, we are hanging there uh, with the Lord's help. And we hope, amen. Yeah. We had our struggles like everybody has our struggles. And let me tell you, we had one big struggle when we actually went to the mission field. The devil, uh, he was not happy with us, and he was trying to, he was putting something in our head, you know, and uh, putting things in my head, he was trying to go farther and farther apart. Uh, and thank God my father-in-law showed up and he, he helped us to really, to reconnect again. Amen. But I know marriage is stronger than ever now, so. Amen. But uh, in one mission conference that she went to God, told us specifically, she was running from that all the time. And this pastor just pointed to her like this. There's someone right there that's running from God. It was like 5,000 people. They said, she was looking at me? Yeah, you, she said. 
you running from where you're calling. And that day she said, honey, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. So the next day, I couldn't call because I was already late, so the next day I called IMB and said, I'm ready. <laughs> All the list you gave me, the last one is being filled. Because <laughs> <laughs> they needed to my wife to be called too. Yeah. So, so now she's a better evangelist than me. Oh. Let me tell you, she's a great evangelist. Uh, we had so many experiences in the, in the field in Portugal. Like I said, uh, Portugal is a land that uh, is a lot of Catholic, 98% uh, Catholic. And uh, the churches need a re revitalization, need to be revived. Many churches are really dying. Uh, most pastors are passing three, four churches to survive because most of them is very small churches. Uh, so you need to pray for a revival in Portugal. The only place that there was a revival in Portugal was in the islands of Portugal. Now is the place that, according to the European Union, has the most, um, what do you call the, the work with, uh, there's a name for these guys. The guys that really take advantage of the kids uh, sexually. Uh, pedophile. Pedophile. That's the most place that have pedophiles in the European Union. The only place that used to have revival now is the place that has most pedophiles. Churches are churches are closing. They're not. So you need to pray for Portugal. Uh, you need to pray for Brazil too, because Brazil, you ask about any prayer, and I forgot about it. This Saturday, and it's coming Saturday, there's going to be election in Brazil. Who's going to be the president? And we have one communist party against a, a Christian party, not a Christian president, a Christian candidate. So the Communist Party was already in power for 12 years. And uh, we are praying that she can win, this lady, that she's a Christian, and she also can help fight uh, for the cause of defending the Christian faith. So just we be praying for Brazil this Saturday, there's going to be election. Saturday or Sunday, I'm not sure. Sunday, Sunday there'll be election in, in Brazil. But uh, my question is, why we do missions? <coughs> Why we do missions? Do you know why we do missions? Anybody can help answer this question? To reach out for Christ. Because I think we Christian, it is I think the 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 will of the church. I think that what takes. I have not seen any church that grows that has passion for missions. Other churches that have passion for missions, they grow because this is the heartbeat of Jesus. This is the heartbeat of the, our Lord, to see people coming to Christ. And uh, so uh, missions characterize the church, if the church wants to be a church of Christ, it has to be the mission. Uh, many things, because we need to learn how to do mercy. Because we talk in, in, in Europe, sometimes when we go there, we talk about, I was talking to the girls, can I say girls? <laughs> uh, about sometimes you come over there and you start talking about Jesus and, and they say, okay, this is nice, but uh, look at my suffering. If Jesus loves me, this is the, actually the mentality. Why do I have to go through this? Now, even us as a Christian, we suffer sometimes to understand why we have to go through pain, why do we have to go through some things. But coming from this perspective, why I have to go through this if Jesus loves me? Because Jesus is Jesus of love. Why I have to suffer? Sometimes we need to figure out how is the best way to approach them and tell them that Jesus is the solution. Jesus loves them. So sometimes we have to do, uh, use a different strategy. In Portuguese, people are very uh, skeptical. Skeptical? Right? When they meet some, the first person. It takes time for them really to get into their lives. It takes sometimes years. And we come from a, a, a society where in Brazil or Africa, if you preach in the corner, you have a church planted that day. Because people come. Now in Europe, it doesn't happen like that. It takes years. And sometimes you get frustrated. Say, why, why, what am I doing wrong? Because people are not coming to Christ. People are not coming to Christ. I, told, I was talking this afternoon, my daughter, uh, my, my wife, doctor, is a very intelligent woman. And she has in her desk, in her office, in her, in her office, she has a spiritism book. Uh, you know, from Africa, voodoo type of thing. She has a, a, um, a yoga book next to it. She had also 
Yeah, another book I don't remember exactly was, and then she had like a 40 days of purpose with Rick Warren right next to it. And after that, my wife gave a Bible to her. She didn't accept the Bible because she said the Bible is not for me. I cannot interpret the Bible. I have to give to a priest that can interpret the Bible for me, so I cannot read it. And this is an intelligent woman. So sometimes I can see, I can sense that people are looking for God. People are looking for a spiritual being, and sometimes they're confused. The Catholic Church in Portugal basically is not a threat at all. I think in Europe, in Italy, or Spain, it's not a threat at all because they are not doing anything. They're just a government, they just, they have tons of their own cities, their own houses, their strategy today. They don't, they don't live because of the offerings. They cannot survive because of the offerings, because they don't have basically offerings. What they survive is because they have, they have a real estate. They have tons of real estate. They own everything. They own TV stations. They own buildings. They own the biggest things in real estate they own. So, but the Catholic Church is not doing anything for the community. They're not doing for anything to show that God is love. And they're showing actually, in, in Portugal, they have called Fatima, which is Mary. In, in, in Mexico, they have Guadalupe, which is also another Mary. In Brazil, you have Aparecida, which is another Mary. And it's so sad to see when it comes to peregrination time, they walk kilometers, they all miles and miles on their knees to pay penitence because grace is not enough for them. See, grace is enough for us because it gave us for free. Amen. Right? But for them, they have to pay for that. And it's a, it's a, money, it's a money machine making because when you go, you, it's very expensive. It's very expensive to buy everything is made in... Uh, what is called the candle material? Wax. The wax? wax. It all is made of wax. People buy wax of your of your legs, your lungs, your heart, your legs, your 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 arms. They buy that and they burn that, saying that I need to be cured on that thing. And I I, I, I wish I could show you the video, but unfortunately we could not show you the video how it is because you can really picture when you see people walking kilometers, kilometers and, and miles and miles just to see that uh, you need to pay a price to get to Christ. And all they need is just to say the word Jesus. All they need is just to, to say, I do receive Jesus. But people know they, they're not, they are very confused. People are confused over there because there's so many evangelical segments and the gospel has been so much uh, confused now for them. For me, the gospel is very simple, but they make it complicated. And so when you go there, people are just basically, uh, okay, you are Christian, right? Okay, good. Oh, but you're also Christian, correct? Yes, you are Christian. You're, but all of you are telling me different things. For me to get to salvation, it's different venues for me to get there. So all of you are telling the truth. So where people are confused in Europe, because you have so many people talking about so, so many things, which they're supposed to be talking about the same thing, no? And unfortunately, many of them are preaching the truth. Uh, uh, they're, the, they're, play, uh, they're preaching lie like it's truth, and the truth like it's lie. And so people are so confused about that. So Europe, it's a, it's a place that it needs a, a, a lot of prayer, because uh, uh, compared to other uh, groups around the world, we we are not growing, we are not producing, uh, we are not seeing results, and it actually frustrates many of us frustrate our leadership to see that we're not actually progressing and sometimes we look and see why what is happening but i believe that the bible says that it's not up to us to make the growth it's up to christ to make the growth and maybe i told my wife maybe the times that we spent in portugal was just to remove rocks out of the way somebody else is going to come and plant it somebody else is going to come and see the fruits we can see many fruits in the soccer in the soccer project that, that, that I was working. I, I told this morning that one of my favorite guys was a goalkeeper. His name is Mingo. He accepted Christ in his heart. He has 24, uh, I think it's 24, 25 brothers and sisters. No father, no mother. He just lived with one of his older sisters. Has no clue. 99% of the kids that I was working, none of them wanted to go to college. Only had like two kids out of 150. They want to be someone. I want to be a doctor, I want to be an architect. But the rest of the guys, none of them want to be nothing. All they want to do is just 
have a nice life now, enjoy the girls, and just all that. But I had so many stories. One of the guys that I had, he, was, he, was, he had a bad temper. He had a bad attitude all the time. And I didn't know why, why he's behaving like that. You know, why he's so mean. And uh, in one of the games, we had, we, had, we had police. In all the games, there's police, there's referees and everything. In one of the games, this guy just took his knife out of the pocket. He wanted to stab one of our same, same team. I said, what's going on? Why you bring a knife to a game? So you cannot bring a knife. I mean, I can't be, I mean, I can't be, there's a fee. I'm probably going to pay a high fee if they catch me that I have someone with a knife. And so I took him out one day to just to talk to him, to get to know him. And I found, then you try to find, then you understand why, where he's coming from. He said, where's your father? He said, my father's in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, why, he, why he's in jail? Because he killed several people, and he's going to be there for probably the rest of his life. And he said, he's my hero. And I just think, his hero is, is a, an assassin. A man that killed people is his hero. And then I, then I started to understand why he behaved like that. Why this kid, and this kid need love. When I, one time when I hugged him and I gave him a kiss, he was so... You know, he was not expecting to receive a hug. Well, he was he melted. I just broke like a big wall between me and him when I actually hugged him. He was not a, he didn't have attention from his father. He didn't have attention from his mother. And his father was in jail. And after I started hugging, talking to him about Jesus, I said, look, um, and I told him, look, I don't, I don't know what, what's going to happen in your future, but I know you can fight for your dreams. What kind of dreams do you have? What do you want to be when you grow up? Say, no clue. I have no idea. You know you can you can be a great man. You can have a great family, a great wife. You can succeed in life. But you need to turn away those things that are really stopping you to grow. And these bad friends that you have, it's not good. Good, not good for you. They're just taking you to the wrong ro road. What I'm trying to give you, at least some love. I want you to understand that Jesus loves you. And he wants to see you a great man. A man that really stands. A man that, like God was looking at David as an old heart. So I talked to him and I prayed with him. But he didn't say anything. But I invited him to come to church one time. I was giving food away. And he came to pick up the food. And one of the boys, one of my friends, give a testimony and did an invitation and he accepted Christ that day. Amen. So he now is a different man. He's a still a young man, he's 18 years old. There's not a lot of future for the uh, youth in Portugal. 50% of the youth population don't have jobs. So half of the population, youth population, don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. The government actually is asking for them to leave the country, go, go away. We don't have jobs for you here. So, uh, a lot of kids don't have future. These kids, the, I mean, I have many stories in here. My wife one time encountered a lady that's a gypsy lady that she read her hands. And she was just, you know, she was dressing in black, an old lady, and we tried to talk to her to get out of that life. She said, I don't, I don't know how to do anything else. That's all I, this is how to bring food to my house. I need to read hands. Because when I get money, I have food to my house. He said, like, oh, I wish I could do something else with this girl, with this lady. But she was talking to this lady and said, can I read your palm? And my wife said, uh, you can read my palm, but only if you allow me to talk about, I can read your palm too. Amen. Right? Yeah. So what do you talk, what, what do you say to her? <laughs> you remember what you said to her? No, I, she said to me, uh, can I read your poem? And I said, no, no. I'm going to read your poem. And I approached her, and I, I started talking about Jesus. And she was like, "Won't she read my poem? How, how is it? So that I started a conversation with her, and I started preaching the gospel. I be, yeah, I believe these days what people really need is, is relationship. Uh, in the in Europe especially, um, I can see that sometimes many many people are so lonely. 
maybe they have everything they need. See, we see, we think that money can bring joy. Money is good, but does not fulfill the emptiness that a lot of people have. I mean, we see so many people that are rich, famous, that are dying. I mean, lately we just heard Robin Williams, a great actor, just commit suicide. You know, many people have money, but this is not actually what they need. They need to hear Jesus Christ. And how can we do that? And how can we do talk about Jesus and show Jesus to these people? Uh, there's a friend of mine that, that, uh, that heard a story about this lady that uh, was working and that to try to help to get girls that was a slave uh, sent in a, in a ship, in a boat, over other part of the country to be slaves of sex. And sometimes they put like 50 girls in a, in a ship and they just put them away like animals. And you know, many of them die along the way because they, of the heat, no food, no water. And, uh, and uh, so she came in, this, actually the lady, that, actually sorry, the lady who gave this testimony is Christian Kane. I don't know if you know her. She's one of the pastors of the Hillsong Church in Australia. And she said uh, they have a ministry of taking girls out of the sla sex slave. And she came to this girl and said, uh, one of the girls that survived, she said, uh, I came because Jesus told me to come here. And she said, why now? Why didn't you come before? All my friends died. And she said, it's not because Jesus did not, you know, I wanted to come. I didn't respond in the right time. So maybe Jesus is telling you sometimes, go do it. See, if you feel that kind of sense that you need to do something, that's the Holy Spirit telling you to go and do something else. And sometimes, like I said in the morning, sometimes we have to get out of our comfort zone. Sometimes we have to leave and do that. And being a mission field, uh, uh, it's not because we overseas. We have, of course, our struggles. One of the biggest things for us because we're, all, we're not close to our families. See, my kids are not able to... to to live and see their grandparents. You know, all, all we have is just us. And this is one of the down things, you know, down files, or I don't know how to say, that being a mission field. But when we see someone coming to Christ, sometimes these days we don't joy anymore when someone comes to Christ. This Portugal, general in the churches, I have traveled a lot in Portugal. Pastors don't do invitations anymore. They don't do invitations. And they say, why? So, there's nobody in New Year. They never uh, visited. And, and it's, a, it's, it's very common. They don't do invitation anymore. They don't do evangelistic outreach. They don't go out. Because we have to tell us to do things to bring people instead of going to there where they are. You know? So we have, me and my wife, we have to change our mindset uh, a lot in how we're going to actually evangelize. Because we grew up in a Christian family, all our friends are Christian. So all the people, how are you going to impact someone that is not Christian if I have a relationship with them? So we started getting out of our comfort zone, meeting people that has nothing to do with us. Uh, one time I even went to a uh, marketing, marketing meeting with only people that do marketing. None of them are Christian. And they asked me, what do you do? I said, I do marketing. Too. <laughs> oh, really? You do marketing? Yes, I do marketing too. I didn't know I actually marketing for Jesus, but you know, I do marketing. So then break the ground so we could talk about marketing, how you promote, how you incentivate, how you make people actually aware of things. So, but we need to get out of my zone. Sometimes you have to learn their way. And you know, to me, to talk to someone that's from Africa, I mean, we study a little bit more about what's, what's going on in their, in their country. What is the, the food that they like? What kind of pol politics things is going on? How is the thing? Because you break in the wall right there. Instead of they coming to my, my, my world, I go to their world. So we have to change our life how we're always doing. So I'll, pr I'll ask you to pray for Europe because Europe is, is it needs, it needs desperate uh, people that are willing to go and... Uh, and, and tell Jesus to others. We try to find strategies to, to best reach. One of the things that's working very well in Portugal is sports. 
We have American football that we have been really reaching a lot of people. One of the one of the guys that came out of the out of football today is the seminary. So we see fruits already happening. We have soccer, we have basketball. So in many countries uh, we are putting uh, professional athletes to go in as a, just professional athletes so they can actually talk about Jesus. Because they cannot go as a missionaries. They have to use a platform to get in. So, uh, so our Jesus is contemporary too. He used different strategy today than he used, used to before. Before he used a different strategy. I think if Jesus was here today, he was not going to walk in a mule or in a donkey. He probably going to fly, use a car, you know, because you got he has to up to date. And I think the church has to also to follow that the that, that same thing. So my my prayers. I know we we finish at six, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, seven. Yeah. So we have two three minutes. Yeah. And I think when we we, we read this morning Matthew twenty eight, I think the reason that we do mission, the, the reason that we have to be obedient to God. Because it's a question of urgency. The time is coming. The Lord is coming very soon. And we can see the signals. We can see the things are happening. Uh, there's actually a, a, a thing on the table right now in the European Union. Where they want every, every single country to, be, to have with just one, one money, one treasure, one government. Exactly. Right now going on, on the... Uh, Euro uh, Parliament, and this is actually biblical, mm -hmm. and they want one God, they want someone, one ruler. Uh, so we need to pray that uh, that uh, Europe, Asia, no, Oceania, I don't know how you, how you say it, but uh, Australia area, Japan, uh, South America. There's still a lot of people. Need to, to hear the gospel, even in America. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we need to see that it's still tons of people here that still need to accept Jesus Christ in their hearts. There's so many, there's so many. I, we're just walking around the city and we can tell the people that's so far away from God. But uh, if, if we had one minute to say anything to say anyone, it probably took, it take us 147 years to say to every single person in the world about Jesus. One minute, just to say something about Jesus Christ. There's 147 countries that still don't, haven't heard anything about the gospel yet. There's, there's, the Bible is not translating all the languages yet. There's a lot to be done. I know probably many of you probably won't be there or, or, or want to go, but definitely you can pray about it. And we don't have our prayer cards here, but I'm, I'm going to come here and bring my prayer cards because we need your prayers. And uh, we're going to a new world, a new uh, challenge that God is putting in our hands. Spain is, is not far from what Portugal is as far as uh, Christianity. There's not a lot of Christians also in, in Spain. In Spain, sometimes they say it's even worse because they, have, they practice the Catholicism. In Portugal, they don't practice. They go to Mass only on Christmas time and Easter. But in Spain, they go every Sunday. So, but uh, uh, in Spain, it's the same thing. Uh, they say they still they need to be hear Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of South Americans that go to Spain. Uh, Italy, if you go to Italy, uh, we are having... Uh, big meeting uh, soon in our cluster, we call cluster, uh, a group of Spain, Italy, and Portugal, that we need to, to think what kind of better strategy we can do to reach these people to Christ. And pray for us, pray for our leadership. We just have a new president. You know the new president we have? He was just elected, the new president of our International Mission Board. He's the youngest president of ever uh, the history of the International Mission, Mission Board. He only had 36 years old. His name is David Platt. I don't know if you ever heard his name. David Platt is the new president. Uh, it is funny, and I finished with this story with David Platt, because I, I know him accidentally kind of thing. I met him. We were in Germany together, and I went to play soccer, and he was playing against me. 
and, and I kicked him very hard. Uh, and I didn't know he was a speaker but to us. Uh, you know, this young, he was younger than me, and said, no, he, so I was just playing hard, hard with him. And actually, I heard him pretty bad, in that, you know, right here. And then he just started walking like this to the Pope, and he said, let's take a class. <laughs> now he's my president, so I've got to send him an email, apologies, all that. <laughs> so just pray for him. Uh, he's a young man, very sharp man. Uh, he was the youngest uh, pastor of the Baptist history to also to take charge of a, of a mega church in, here in the United States. Uh, he is a very mission-oriented person. So pray for him. His name is David Blatt. You just type it there. He has a program in the radio on Joy FM called Radical. Have you heard Radical? That's him, David Platt. And uh, he's a fantastic man. So be praying for our family. Pray for our kids for adjustments. Uh, uh, Lucas and Victoria basically just grew up learning Portuguese. This year they're learning English. Next year they're going to learn Spanish. And the year after that they're going to learn Valencian. So it's going to be four languages in four years. So, uh, so we be praying for them, for them to, for little heads, you know, really to, to grasp their language. I know they will. Sometimes the parents will suffer more than, than they're, they're doing. But be praying for us. Uh, I just want to finish with the prayer. We're going to sing a song. Oh, well, we're just going to finish with prayer. Whatever you want to do. Okay, I just want to pray first. Uh, pray. Let's, let's stand up for a little. Uh, I'm glad to hear the good news of the pastor. Uh, it shows that Jesus is in, is in his side. He's in his favor. His grace is showing up again uh, when he needed it. Uh, let's pray first. Heavenly Father, first of all, Lord, uh, I just want to thank you for this church. Thank you for the heart of this church. Thank you for the vision. Um, I ask you, Lord, to, to put your blessings upon each life here, Lord. I know there's probably people that haven't come today, but uh, you know this, what's going on. But you continue to show your grace, your love towards them, Lord. Thank you. For the news that the pastor is doing well thank you for the surgery and it's a big victory we can celebrate with you lord that uh, he's cancer free now lord and uh, help their family to go through this process of healing or process of uh, recovering give strength to his wife and uh, his family uh, lord we're so thankful that we can call our children that we can be called your children lord thank you for because one day you have touch our hearts and you moved us and you convinced us that uh, the best thing for every man and woman is to be uh, in your center Lord to give our hearts to you thank you for, for the rain that is coming so beautiful Lord just to hear how beautiful and how honorful you are uh, Lord bless us out in this next week that is coming we are traveling tomorrow Lord to Richmond Virginia and that we can go there and just also have a time of refreshing with our colleagues and friends in here how God is doing, how you're doing around the world. And we thank you so much for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.